This episode of Crash Course is brought to you by Squarespace. Hello, I'm Craig, and this is Crash Course Government and Politics, and today we're going to look at why Congress acts the way it does. More specifically, we're going to try to figure out as much as we can without being mind readers the factors that influence congressmen when they make decisions. Then after that, we'll be mind readers, and then we'll, we'll see if we were right. This should be a welcome change of pace from the last couple episodes where we delved into the gory details of how Congress works, or is supposed to work anyway. <laughs> So, to oversimplify greatly, but also to help those of you studying for tests, there are three main factors or agents that influence congressmen in making their decisions. Their constituency, interest groups, and political parties. And they vary in importance depending on the situation that a congressman is in. Our basic understanding of democracy and representative government suggests that constituents would matter most to representatives and senators. And fortunately, this is sometimes the case. Unfortunately, this is sometimes the case. If a congressperson ignores what the voters in his or her district want, they're probably not going to be in office for very long. Representatives pay the most attention to their constituents when they are actually voting on bills because votes are a record that constituents can easily check, say, right before an election. If this is the case, then the relative lack of important congressional votes in recent years tells us something. Nowadays, congressmen are more likely to depend on direct service to constituents, what is sometimes called casework, to build up their record. This might be why congressmen tend to spend much more time in their home states and districts than in Washington. They might also want to check up on their lawn, you know. It grass grows. You gotta mow it. Constituents' views can influence congressmen even without the threat of unseating them in an election, though, because congressmen can anticipate what the voters will want and respond to this. They manage this through public opinion polling. The more sophisticated polling is, the better representatives are at crafting their message, and maybe even their votes, to what their constituents want. We're gonna devote a number of episodes to interest groups in the future, explaining what they are and where they come from. I know this because I'm psychic. But for now, it's important to recognize that they are incredibly important to congressmen, although not for the reasons you might think. Let's go to the thought bubble. Okay. When I mention interest groups, or say the phrase special interest, you probably imagine some guy in a suit, maybe even a fedora, surreptitiously handing a suitcase full of money to a congressman in return for his vote on some issue of supreme importance to the interest group that the suit guy represents. Or maybe you think that interest groups are more subtle than this, buying votes with campaign contributions. This stereotypical view presents a dramatic story and paints a picture that sticks in your head, but there's no empirical evidence that it's true. I hope the fedora part's true, though. That's probably true. The main thing that interest groups provide to congressmen is information that they can use in writing a bill or making a policy case to their constituents. One of the big things in American government is that information is very important and very valuable. On the other hand, interest groups do give an awful lot of money to campaigns. They also provide a lot of research and assistance in the writing of bills. Interest groups are most influential at the committee stage of legislation, rather than when congressmen are casting floor votes and their influence tends to be mostly negative. This means that rather than inserting items into legislation, it's much easier and more effective to exclude potential provisions from laws. Plus, this practice, and maybe the fedoras a little bit, makes it easier to obfuscate special interests' influence on laws. It's harder to show that interest groups have kept something out of a law than that they put something into it. Thanks, Thought Bubble. That brings us to our third big influencer, political parties. Woohoo! Oh, not that kind of party. The way that political parties affect lawmakers is even more complex than the role of interest groups. A disciplined party leadership can put pressure on a congressman to vote a certain way. They call them whips for a reason. But this only works when the party is unified and strong. The weaker the party, the more freedom the representative has to go rogue on some issues and votes. If there are many different factions within a party, there's less of a consequence for not voting along the party line. This is why I don't have friends. Freedom. The clearest example of this is the so-called Hastert Rule, named after former Speaker Denny Hastert, who would only bring a bill to the floor of the House for a vote if a majority of the majority party, in his case, Republicans, supported it. Side note, if you've got the majority and the party unity to pull off a stunt like that, you really end up looking like an effective speaker. Parties also help to organize log rolling, which is relatively straightforward quid pro quo bargaining. You vote for my farm bill, Senator, and I'll support your banking bill. You vote for my not punching eagles bill, eagle, and I won't punch you. Not voting for it? You've been log rolled. Is that how that word works? Log rolling occurs most obviously at the voting stage, but can also be part of the writing of legislation in committees. When we talk about parties, we talk about me. But when we talk about political parties, we can't leave out the president, who is the de facto leader of his party and its most influential member. I'm pretty sure you're aware of that. The president has the most power when his party and the majority party in Congress are the same. When this happens, Congress usually follows the president's lead and allows him to set the policy agenda. That way, they can take some credit if the policy is a winner and avoid some blame if it turns out not so great. We saw this most recently with the creation of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, which was written and passed during the first two years of the Obama presidency when his party, the Democrats, also had the majority of both houses. Divided government, when the president and the congressional majority are in opposite parties, works well for Congress too because it makes it super easy to set a policy agenda. They just oppose whatever the president wants. This type of obstructionism is, unfortunately, Unfortunately, pretty common in Congress today. Just look at the years from 2010 to 2012 when Congress's program could be summed up in four words. Repeal Obamacare and replace it. 
Wait, that's not true. That's five words. To sum up, political parties are most influential over Congress when a single party controls both houses and the presidency, and when the party leadership is strong enough to exert discipline and a degree of uniformity of policy. So that's about it for the factors that influence congressional decision making. Really, Stan, that's it? That's all? I'm going on break. Well, obviously there are other factors like the personal lives of individual congressmen and maybe congressional history, but since this is a broad survey of American government and politics, we can't easily get into that without taking less breaks. And I'm, I'm gonna go on break. For my money, it's the structures of Congress, and most of all, which party has a majority and thus controls the leadership and the committees that makes the most difference, even though I wanna say and believe that constituents matter most, because I don't wanna feed into the cynicism that seems to come so naturally in discussions of Congress. But I think we should try to avoid any cynicism and conspiracy theories when we try to figure out why a congressperson acted a certain way and recognize that any congressional decision is the product of the complex interaction of a number of factors, only some of which will be apparent. Each of these decisions will be conditioned and constrained by the structures and procedures of Congress itself. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash Course Government and Politics is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. Support for Crash Course U.S. Government comes from Vocal. Vocal supports nonprofits that use technology and media to advance social equity. Learn more about their mission and initiatives at vocal.org. Crash Course was made with the help of all these nice people. Thanks for watching.